guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Barb. And she is a boundaries coach. Um, she's got a really interesting uh, story and journey and a lot of value for the audience. Um, and I'm happy to welcome her to the show. So Barb, welcome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Christopher. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for <clears throat> inviting me. Yeah. So I know um, I know we talked extensively before this. So um, just kind of, you know, I, like I said, um, you're free to tell your story and mm -hmm. what you do and how the audience mm -hmm. can benefit. Sure. So I am a sociologist by training. I have a master's degree in sociology. I worked for 19 years at Yale University as a program coordinator for urban education, prevention, and policy research. And so I did a lot of the behind the scenes stuff and I was on the research and evaluation team. And 17 years into my time at Yale, I hit a codependent bottom. And this was after a lifetime of therapy and self-help and I landed in 12 step recovery. And I think of all of the decades of personal growth and self-help and therapy I did as scratching the surface of the iceberg of my life and recovery melted the iceberg of my life. And so for me, the 12 steps of recovery are where it's at. And then um, after being there for 19 years, I ended up getting laid off from Yale and through a series of serendipitous events, um, found my way into the world of entrepreneurship, startup and innovation at Yale and in New Haven. And I was like, oh my God, these are my people. And I had already realized the people in 12 step recovery were my people. And I ended up deciding to start my own business, my own coaching and consulting business. And um, like, as with any business, you have to niche, but I think especially in coaching, because there's a gajillion things that you could coach people on. So I eventually decided to hone in on boundaries coaching because as a person who's a codependent, among other things, learning how to build healthy boundaries is basically the antidote to codependency. And I am the kind of woman who I looked on the outside like I had it together, but on the inside, I was a mess. I think the only thing I really knew was that I had a history of just a long string of very dysfunctional romantic relationships. It wasn't until I got into recovery that I learned, oh no, it's not just the romantic relationships. It was the, it's the family, which I probably knew. It's the friends, it's the colleagues. I realized I had a 19 year codependent relationship with my boss who I loved dearly, but she also drove me crazy. And it, it was probably the first two to three years in recovery that I, through this meandering haphazard path, ended up building boundaries. I didn't know that was what I was doing. And after I was pretty clear, like, oh, I have boundaries now. This is amazing. I started reading about them, Christopher. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what I was doing. This is the, these are the concepts. This is what changed for me. But as I was reading, I would draw these visuals to depict what I was seeing visually in my mind, because I'm a pretty visual person. And those visuals turned into handouts, which turned into a workbook, which is the spine of my boundaries coaching program. And so when I decided to niche, I picked boundaries because they were such a game changer for me. And as a professional woman, I was astonished at just me building healthy boundaries, the ripple effect that had on my team and on my organization. So I want that for other professional women. So I've really, I've always coached mostly professional women like managers and business owners and nonprofit workers, but I've really just this year decided, okay, that's who I'm very specifically targeting. So that is my lightning speed story for um, how I got to be where I'm at. Yeah. Um, and I really want to ask you about the uh, codependency because that's really interesting. So um, you identified it, got out of it. For people that are not consciously aware of these mm -hmm. patterns, what are the mm -hmm. signals to look for? Yeah. So that's a really good question because even though I was incredibly well-versed in the self-help genre and therapy, et cetera, I had never heard that word and I was astonished. So I would say in its um, most basic form, codependence is we a person who is codependent is reliant on that which is outside themselves. So that often means that we need someone else to be okay so we can be okay. 
Um, I need someone's approval. It could be I'm overly concerned with other people and what they're doing or maybe what they're not doing, what they're saying and thinking, especially what they're saying and thinking about me. Um, as a codependent, we often feel the need to rescue, fix, and save other people. You know, there's a term that used to be used many years ago, isn't so much anymore, which is called enabling, which um, that's part of codependency as well. So what we do, we do things that we think are going to help, uh, like, say, an addict or an alcoholic in our life to either stop drinking or reduce drinking or maybe get into rehab or you know, something, recovery or something like that. We think that we're, quote, helping them, but in fact, we're making it easier for them to continue drinking. So a classic example might be um, a family whose adult child is 35 years old, lives at home, doesn't pay any rent, doesn't have a job, and like drinks and gets drunk all the time. And the parents complain, but they allow them to stay in the house and they pay for their food and they pay their bills and all that sort of thing. So they're enabling the person to continue in their addiction. It doesn't mean that the person will necessarily stop the addiction if they, say, kick them out of the house. But um, at least they're not being completely drained and that sort of thing. So I, I feel like that's a pretty good description of codependence, pretty comprehensive. It's really interesting. And so, um, you know, we'll talk about uh, what spurred my, to my mind is um, it's like this idea of lack of boundaries. So how do you properly draw boundaries? Yeah, that is the big question, isn't it? So, you know, when I, after I had boundaries, people would say, how did you know what your boundaries were? Because that's a lot of people are like, I don't know what my boundaries are. I didn't either because I was such a yes woman. I was such a chameleon. And what I realized is I know what my boundaries are by what's important to me. So when I start with my clients, the first thing I have them do before we even start coaching is an exercise to discern their top five values. And then they're going to use those values as guideposts. So let's use health as an example. Most people can identify with that. So if you say, all right, health is a really high value. And so you might have financial boundaries around your health. So you might say, I'm going to spend money towards things like exercise, clothing, and equipment, classes. Um, I am going to um, go on a trip so that I can run a marathon. You might have um, also financial boundaries around the type of like, you're going to pay extra for like organic or grass fed, you know, food, that sort of thing. Um, you can have social boundaries. So one of my social boundaries is I really try not to get together for people for meals. I'll get together for coffee, but I'd rather go for a walk with you. So those are those are some really easy examples. Does that make it clear for you? Yeah. And the other um the other question I really had was um, you know, in these um once you identify it, how do you get out of it? Because obviously the topic mm -hmm. of codependency is you know very complex mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so how do you get out of it how do you break free what do you do if you know like if it's your parent or a spouse mm -hmm. or yeah you know a yeah. kid it's like it's yeah like a leap. yeah so um there's a saying that's really common in 12-step recovery that people most people have probably heard of which is one day at a time and and the reason that we say that is because most of us look at this big giant problem, this lifelong pattern that we have. We're like, oh my God, how am I ever going to break this decades long pattern? Well, you're going to do it one day at a time. And like we can, that's like basically the wisdom of the world. The, you know, uh, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? The uh, journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You take the first step. And so it starts with you because part of the problem for codependents is that they're so externally focused that they don't, they're not paying any attention. I'll give you a really, like this was a stark example that shocked me when I first got into recovery. I was on a road trip with somebody and I had to go to the bathroom and he said, we should stop here because I don't know the next time we'll hit one. I go, that's okay, I'll wait. He goes, you know what? That's so codependent. And I was like, what? He said, codependent people often do not relieve themselves immediately. They wait because they're so focused on external input that they ignore literally even their bodily signals like my bladder is full. And I was shocked about that. 
So we need to start focusing on ourselves. And this is like a mantra I'd say to my clients, keep the focus on yourself, keep the focus on yourself, keep the focus on yourself. And what that means is you cannot control people, places, or things. This is why so many codependents are exhausted and drained because they're trying to control the uncontrollable and they don't put any focus on themselves, which is the only thing they can control. It may not feel like you can control yourself, but you actually have the capability. Maybe in this moment you can't, but you can learn to do that. And so would it be helpful if I shared some of the ways that I teach people to keep the focus on themselves? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, the first one is to ask yourself, what do I want and need in this situation? I never asked that. I was always like, what does he need? What does she need? What do they need? What does the situation need? What does the organization need? What does is, what is the discipline need? So you ask yourself, what do I want and need? And in the beginning, you're not going to give it to yourself, but just even like knowing that's amazing because a lot of people like don't know what they need. So another is to mind your own business. So like as a former people pleaser, rescue, fix your savior, I was constantly foisting my help on people who didn't necessarily want it. I was giving unsolicited advice. It is wonderful to help people, but please get their consent or better yet, wait till they ask. Another one is the way that we phrase it in 12-step recovery is what's my part? The way that I would say that in in like regular everyday parlance is what might I be doing to contribute to this situation? So if you find yourself in a recurring pattern, especially if it happens in various areas of your life, you're the common denominator. So ask yourself, what might I be doing to contribute to this? And or what could I do differently? Because if you seek what you're doing, you will find it. But if you never look for it, you won't. And then another way to keep the focus on yourself is to take really good care of yourself. Most codependents neglect the hell out of themselves. They don't take good care of themselves. They run themselves ragged. And the way that I think of it is don't stop trying to pour from an empty cup. What you want to do is pour from the overflow. So that your cup is never empty. Well, the only way you're going to have an overflow is if you fill it first. And then the last way that I recommend keeping the focus on yourself is to manage your own feelings and not other people's feelings. Because a lot of people, like I literally felt other people's feelings and that has ended. I don't do that anymore. And I also try to manage other people's feelings. What I mean by that, Christopher, is if somebody was sad, I felt like it was my job to cheer them up. But if something sad happened, they get to be sad about it. Like if they're grieving, they get to grieve that somebody died. So they're their feelings and they get to feel whatever they want. The better thing to do than to try to cheer them up is to say, is there anything I can do? Or my prayers are with you if you're a praying person, or I'm here if you need me, you know, open-ended things, not, you know, look on the bright side sort of thing. So those, those are really, really helpful in getting people to take that focus off of the outside world of people, places, and things and placing it internally where they can actually make a difference. Really insightful. Um, I know we have around six minutes remaining and um, I wanted to ask you about the association between emotional trauma and codependency and lack of boundaries. How do these interplay? Yeah. I mean, high, Mm. high, high correlation, you know, so my main program is called adult children of alcoholics and dysfunctional families. And that is a trauma recovery program. The vast majority of the people in there have emotional trauma as opposed to like actual physical trauma, though plenty of them do. And um, there's an absolute Uh, I wouldn't just say it's a correlation. I would say it's causation that, you know, when you are emotionally traumatized, you do not have boundaries because you can't, because you're with, you're in a really emotionally unsafe environment and you do whatever you have to do. You have to be hyper vigilant on typically it's your parents, but maybe it's not them. You have to be hyper vigilant and try to like, like make things safe for yourself. So what did, who did they need me to be to avoid their wrath? And so we, we grow up being chameleons and as children, 
it saved our lives. We made it out of childhood, but it's not serving us any longer as an, as adults. But I just want to say, I don't think I said this. I was 52 when I got into recovery. So I would say I was probably like 54 or 55 by the time I had really healthy boundaries. So it's never too late. Like you, you're not too old. I don't care how old you are. Like these patterns can change and I'm living proof. How do people reach out to you and find out more about the work that you do? Yeah. So if you're listening to this podcast on a podcast app, you can hop on over to Fragmented to Whole Life Lessons from 12 Step Recovery. At this this moment, I have 275 episodes and they're 10 to 20 minutes long. Um, And then my favorite place to hang out on um, social media is Instagram. I'm at Higher Power Coaching and I do private and group coaching and all of my links are in my bio on Instagram. And even if you're not on an app right now, you can go to fragmentedtopole.com and find all kinds of links to different apps for where you can listen to my podcast. Yeah, really enjoyed the conversation. And it's, uh, you know, I wanted to ask so much more, but we out of time. So um, I asked the audience to give Barb a like and follow on our socials and check out her work. And thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. You asked great questions.